Hola amigos, I know it's been a while since I rapped at you. I'm Nick Malloy. welcome to An Evil Mind, a crime fiction video blog from Xenobooks. Uh, this week we're going to talk about uh, the women who are known collectively as the queens of crime, uh, specifically a British mystery fiction of the early uh, 20th century, you know, period roughly between World War I and World War II, although most of these authors continued into the 1960s. Um, these would be uh, Engayo Marsh, uh, Marjorie Allingham, Agatha Christie, and Dorothy L. Sayers. Um, you know, I've read books from all of them. Uh, really, just speaking for myself, um, I did not particularly enjoy Engayo Marsh's uh, first book about her detective, uh, Roderick Allen, uh, A Man Lay Dead, or Marjorie Allingham's book about Albert Cambe, excuse me, Albert Campion, or perhaps Albert Campion, uh, Flowers for the Judge, which I think is actually the fifth book in his series. I just I couldn't lay hold of any uh, earlier ones. Um, they're very typical of their genre. Now, if after watching this, or if after you've had uh, other exposure to, to such books, or, or if, you, if you tried the books yourself and you like them, that's great. They didn't really do much for me. Um, and I didn't start this to dump on people, so I'm not going to tell you really about the things I didn't like, but I would prefer to tell you about the things that I do like. Um, and to varying degrees, my preferences ran to Christie and Sayers. Um, Christie, you know, obviously I've read, uh, you know, Murder on the Nile, Death on the Nile, rather, sorry, Murder on the Orient Express, because of those are the Christie books, and if you haven't read any others ever, you've read those. But also I read the very first of the Poirot books, uh, which was The Mysterious Affair at Styles, and also the very first Marple book, Miss Marple, which is uh, Murder of the Vicarage. And they're different than you would think uh, in, in certain ways. The Marple book, um, you know, I, I haven't read any of the later Marple books, but that one, the character is a little, I, I think a little different for how she's, she's been portrayed in adaptations, and, and, and of course I've, I've seen some of those. Um, she is not the narrator. Um, the book is not a, a, a told in the third person. It's told in the first person by the titular uh, vicar, you know, in whose home the murdered party is found. Uh, Marble is kind of the old lady in the village that just always keeps an eye on everything, and she's got a lot of judgments to make, and she's not shy about making them. She's a fairly mean old lady. Um, uh, I'm kind of curious. I haven't read any, any of the additional Marple books after this. I'm kind of curious about it just to see where she goes. Um, Poirot, in the Styles book, we get a little bit of an origin story in him. He has been wounded in World War I. He's convalescing in England because he, he is himself a Belgian national and a member of their, of their, their national police force. Um, Poirot, even in that book, is already the Poirot we will know from later books and, the, and basically the Poirot that uh, we see in adaptations. They don't work some of his shtick as hard as it may get worked later or definitely as it has worked in adaptations. For example, all the little gray cells jazz. Um, so there's not a lot of surprises there. Captain Hastings, his sidekick, is in that book. Hastings is not as uh, developmentally disabled as he's <laughs> presented in some of the later adaptations. Um, the ones with, with David Suchet, uh, Hastings has, has seemed particularly uh, stupid. I mean, almost on a level with like Nigel Bruce in the, uh, the Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmeses. Um, but those aren't the ones, I mean, I like those and I plan to read some more. I can't really get as excited about them. The ones that I really dug and, and the, the, the ones that I'm actually probably mostly here to, to talk to you about today uh, Dorothy L. Sayers books about Lord Peter Whimsey. On his face, um, Whimsey should be a much more annoying character than at least than I find him to be. First off, you got that name for crying out loud. It's, it's a name as destiny thing, and ordinarily I hate that stuff. Um, but Whimsey is also humanized. Um, in the books, he's not just like a gimmicky wise ass. In, in the way that, say, um, 
God, S.S. Van Dyne's character, Philo Vance is. Philo Vance is kind of like an American version of a whimsy. You know, he's, he's, he's an idle, rich guy who solves crimes as a hobby, um, but he, he's much more affected than whimsy is. Uh, whimsy is actually fairly down to earth, and we're taking that as, as a result of his, his military service, I think. Um, and that's one of the things that humanizes him. Whimsy is also a World War I veteran, like Poirot, like, well, Bulldog Grumman, like a lot of characters of uh, that era in British crime fiction. There's a reason for that. People say, you know, why, you know, why are so many uh, private eye characters, for example, ex-police officers? Uh, well, as someone who's writing a series about an ex-police officer who becomes a private detective, things like working for... Uh, being a police officer or being in the military are the kind of places where your protagonist is going to acquire the sorts of skills that they need to be effective uh, crime fighters. You know, it's a place where you get experience shooting, you get experience uh, in, in, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, that kind of thing, and, and those are helpful skills for a private eye, whether a professional one or an amateur private eye, such as Whimsy is, for all practical intents and purposes, as, for example, Albert Campion is. Um, Whimsy suffers significantly from PTSD. Um, the implication is strong that part of his flighty uh, kind of, 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 of fancy lad persona uh, is, is, you know, twofold. It's, it's covering up the pain that he feels as a result of his military experience in, in the trenches. Um, and it's, but it's also, um, the, the, there's the implication that maybe, you know, aside, you know, PTSD aside, he may have gotten himself a, a little mentally scrambled uh, in the war. And this, this, is a, this is a show not tell lesson. When, in the very first book, when Whimsy has um, a, a nightmare flashback episode uh, where he awakens in the night and thinks he's still in the trenches, that just sneaks up on you. Um, Sayers just tosses that into the book with no warning. Um, which is probably the best way to handle I suppose a modern author might have told us how much as part of exposition, might have had, you may have, may have just had the authorial voice telling us that how much Whimsy suffered in the war. Um, instead, Sayers just whacks us in the face with it unexpe unexpectedly in what had otherwise been um, a relatively light uh, take on a murder case. Um, and that's a, that's a, I think that's the best possible way to uh, handle it. And he is comforted in this by Bunter, who was his uh, NCO uh, when, you know, Whimsy, of course, being a member of the British nobility, uh, was an officer in the First World War. And his, his, um, his assistant, his batman, as they were known at the time, was Bunter, who then continued to be employed by Whimsy in civilian life after the war. Um, interestingly, you know, Whimsy's experiences did not turn him into a racist animal, <laughs> like what happened with Bulldog Grumman. You know, um, you know Whimsy's not out there uh, horse whipping uh, Jewish anarchists. But uh, they're funny books in, in a lot of ways, even though the material uh, in question, you know, I mean, there's a murder case, so it is treated seriously. In the second book, uh, we get even more um, uh, illumination about Whimsy's life because in the second book, it is his brother who is accused of the murder that Whimsy has to solve. Uh, and it is his brother's uh, stifling uh, class awareness that keeps him from offering any information in his own defense that, that, would, that would otherwise uh, clear him of the question. So Whimsy's got to go out and find out the truth and find out what his brother is hiding out of a misguided sense of propriety. So it's also, it's a good portrait of the British upper classes of the era. Certainly it humanizes, like I said, uh, it, you know, Whimsy and makes him, you know, less of a privileged butthead that you might feel some 
some distaste for. And, you know, these books, it's reductive to call them, call these types of, of novels and call this period of British crime fiction uh, the Garden Party Mystery. Although that is uh, a setting of some of them. Um, a Man Lay Dying, the, the Angayo Marsh book, for example, does take place at such a, uh, an extended weekend. You know, I mean, you're rich British guys between the war, the huge country house, and they're going to have guests in. There's, you know, it could be a couple dozen people. I mean, th this persists even into America. For example, you know, such a, 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 a weekend uh, party gathering at an estate is a, is a plot factor in Mickey Spillane's Eye of the Jury. Um, which it's weird for a hard-boiled novel of that era to, you know, gather up all your suspects in one place, which was a standard feature of these kind of British books. Um, but so even if it's not a weekend garden party, you know, most of these books use that trope where there is some reason for everybody to be gathered at one place. So you've got all these suspects and you have to eliminate them one by one or they start dying one by one. And um, eventually, you know, your, your detective is going to come up with the guilty party and have the big uh, showy denouement where they, you know, they get whoever remains together and start laying out the piecework of their investigation until finally they point at the guilty guy and he freaks out and is either, you know, captured or, or killed in an attempt to, to escape. Um, whimsy, the whimsy books, the Sayers... Dorothy Sayers paints the uh, British upper class in a less sympathetic, probably more realistic light. And she doesn't, which does not mean that she automatically characterizes all of them as, um, uh, you know, vermin. Um, <laughs> even though there is, there is a take to be made about these uh, books where, you know, depending upon one's political inclinations, you might... You look at this and say, I don't care who's killing uh, these rich jerks, and they could feel free to continue killing them. Um, so, you know, she, uh, like I said, there's a, a, Sayers takes a relatively light uh, comic take with this. The violence is generally off screen, the violence is relatively not bloody. Um, but you know, it's these. You know, the characters are actual people. Um, even someone like uh, Whimsy's brother, who is kind of a, a cartoon of priggishness, um, is still furnished with realistic, sensible uh, motives for his actions. You know, he's he, he does not he doesn't do these things arbitrarily. You know, for example. Um, but the, so those are the books that I would, I would go at first, uh, the Sayers books, Christie second. If you like this kind of book, by all means explore uh, Ngaio Marsh. Uh, by all means explore uh, uh, Marjorie Allingham's books. Uh, sorry for the zoom there. I, I don't have my selfie stick on me as I'm using my arms. Um, they're not bad books, they just were not to my taste. Um, these other books were more to my taste, um, and thus the ones that I recommend, but they're all of a piece in this subgenre. And at some point, I really kind of got to do the necessary reading to go after, uh, like I said, the Philo Vance. And there, there, there were American versions of this to which the hard-boiled books of, say, Carol John Daly, Raoul Whitfield, uh, you know, certainly Mickey Spillane, Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, you know, the, all the black mass dime detective stuff in the U.S. was a reaction to these uh, British books and their American imitators. Okay, so we're about to hit 15 minutes. I have rambled. Uh, coming up, I need to do Asian detectives who are not written by Asians, uh, Asian authors. Um, also, if I can do some reading, I want to talk about clergymen in crime fiction. Certainly there is, uh, you know, the, the Rabbi books, uh, Cad Fail, which are there's the subject of some excellent adaptations with Derek Jacoby, uh, and certainly, of course, G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown mysteries. So we'll be doing those soon. Like I said, it, it's just kind of dependent upon me finding the time to do the reading, and I'm still wrapping up a novel, and I'm still working on a screenplay. 
here too. So it's been a busy couple of months, but hopefully that, that slacks off a little bit and then I actually will finally hopefully have a, a second uh, uh, Ken McGreevy book out. So thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this, go back and watch some of the other ones. Please sign up uh, for notifications and subscribe to the channel. There are sales links in the description below. And I appreciate your time. Thanks again for watching. Alrighty, bye.